Good morning. It's Monday, June 16th, 7.30 a.m. here in Spanish Fork, Utah, Mountain Daylight Time. Uh, we're starting another round of Bhagavatam classes, still in the first canto. Decided to spend another day on this excellent verse, Srinvatam Shrakata Krishna Punya Sovanu Kirtanam Ridantashtu Abhadani Viduno Di Saritsatam. We'll get to that as soon as I offer respectful obeisances unto our spiritual master, Morning Anjali. Om Aganati Miranda Shangana Gana Salakaya Chak Suvarun Miri Tam Yana Tajmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manovistam Stapitam Yana Bhutare Sayam Rupakaramayam Darati Swaparantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamaram Sri Gurun Vaishnavam Sta Sri Rupam Sagadatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Savarutam Parijana Sayitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitam Sta Nama Om Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pastaya Bhutade Srimadhi Bhaktivedanta Sami Tanamani Namaste Sarasati Deva Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesa Sanyori Praskata De Satarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadada Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Narayanam Namaskritam Naram Chevanarotamam Devam Sarasatim Vyasam Tito Jeo Diryat Nashta Prayasho Badresu Nitcham Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavatiya Tamashoki Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki Nikamaka Paduru Garitam Param Shukam Akaramita Dravisamitam Pivata Bhagavatam Rasha Madhyam Mahora Haru Supa Babika Bhagaha Good morning, my Bhavi. I like Anjali comes up with nice turns of phrases. She calls this Motivation Monday. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Tomorrow will be, according to Anjali, Taco Tuesday. You need to come up for something for Wednesday, but you've got 48 hours to do it. <clears throat> Certainly a good verse for motivating ourselves on this <clears throat> Monday morning, June the 16th. From the first canto, second chapter, uh, 17th verse. Morning, Thomas. Hari Hari Bo. It's our second day on this particular verse. Srin Vatam Shrakata Krishna. Punya Sravana Kirtanam Ridantashtu Abhadani Vidu Nauti Saritsatam. Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma, super soul in everyone's heart, and the benefactor of the truthful devotee, cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted <clears throat> purport. One cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless one is perfectly cleared of all sins. The material sins are products of our desires to lord it over material nature. It is very difficult to get rid of such desires. Women and wealth are very difficult problems for the devotee making progress on the devotional path back to home, back to Godhead. Many stalwarts in the devotional line fell victim to these allurements and thus retreated from the path of liberation. But when one is helped by the Lord himself, the whole process becomes as easy as anything by the divine grace of the Lord. Last week we talked about the famous cleansing of the Gundicha temple by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And interestingly enough, after cleaning the inside of the temple, which represents the inside of our hearts, not once but twice, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu <clears throat> cleaned the outside of the temple very thoroughly also. And his meaning behind that was that sometimes we embark upon the devotional path and after <clears throat> advancing to some degree then we again get allured by material inducements thinking that we need money or fame or leverage in order to support better the Krishna consciousness movement when in fact all we really need to do is save ourselves first and then we can save others. Jivasya tatva jignasya, human form of life is meant for inquiry into the absolute truth other than that, all we need is just subsistence, jivasya. We just need to keep body and soul together. And especially after having embarked on the devotional path, then not to go back out again for earning money and raising a family. One rule of thumb that Prabhupada often used was, if a college student would come to him uh, proposing that he become an active devotee, Prabhupada would say, are you at the beginning of your college four years or at, you, at the end? If, the, if he said, I'm at the end, I've only got a year to go, then Prabhupada would say, finish. You've invested so much, just finish it up. 
But if they said, I'm just beginning, he'd say, forget it. <laughs> yes, come tomorrow, move into the temple. Better you spend those four years becoming an expert preacher in Krishna consciousness than going to the slaughterhouse of university education. And elsewhere, Prabhupada says, if you learn the Bhagavatam in and out, <clears throat> you learn the Bhagavatam thoroughly, it's a complete education. If you know the Bhagavatam, you can talk to any big Nobel laureate, any PhD, any scientist, any teacher, any philosophy, any preacher, any world leader, and you'll not be bested. You'll come out on top. And so um, it's, Lord, it's significant that Lord Chaitanya went outside the Gundicha temple and cleaned it as a caution that all you really need is the name of Krishna, prasadam, and service to do and the Srimad Bhagavatam to discuss amongst devotees as we do every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning at 7.30 a.m. Otherwise, uh, how does one get allured first, second, third time into sense gratification? Very clearly explained here in the 62nd verse of the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Dayato vishayam pumsam sangat teshu vijayate sangat sanjayate kama krama krota vijayate. We begin contemplating the objects of the senses. And these objects of the senses, to the degree that we pursue temporary things rather than the eternal connection with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they're described as poisonous. Vishayan. So as we contemplate the objects of the senses, subtly uh, we develop an attachment for them. Sangat teshu bhajayate, sanjayate kamam, and that mild passing attachment would be like to date him or date her. I wonder what it would be like to have that position, to be a manager in that company. I wonder what it would be like to live in that kind of a house, or I wonder what it would be like to drive in that car with all the sizzle factor. So that passing infatuation thickens and becomes an absolute necessity. From just thinking it would be nice, one transitions into saying, I've got to have that car, I've got to live in that house, I've got to have that management position, I've got to date that girl. While contemplating just passingly, the object of the senses, the person develops attachment for them. And from such attachment, kama, lust, raises its angry head. <laughs> Kami connection. Yeah, okay, now we're on the Wi-Fi connection, so it'll be a much more steady connection. Remember, for 10 long years, the Greeks attacked frontally the tall, impregnable walls of Troy. They weren't able to make a dent in it. And finally, it was only after they pretended to sail away, they got in their ships and sailed away and left a horse, a Trojan horse, for the Greeks as a sign of capitulation, supposedly. The Greeks, the Trojans, took the horse into the city and little to be known to them, in the belly of the hollow of that horse were soldiers. So at night, with the horse inside the gates of the city, and all the Trojans asleep, a very elite cadre of Greeks uh, got down through a trap door from the horse, and they opened the gates. Meanwhile, the ships had returned in the dark of night. And because of that betrayal from the inside, the, tr the city, which was otherwise impregnable, fell to the conquering Greeks. It was sacked and destroyed. Similarly, lust, mahasano maha papmam, vidyanam yavadanam, lust sits inside of us within the senses. And so when we get attracted externally, what happens is that external attraction ignites the sedentary lust from within us. And once that lust ignites, it's no longer a passing attraction. It's no longer an infatuation. It's no longer a take it or leave it situation. I've got to have that object of my senses. And from that point, there's only one outcome, anger. Either you get it, become disappointed, which results in anger. You don't get it, that results in anger. 
where you get it and someone takes it away. Guess what? It also results in anger. And yet all this has to do with something, some sense object, which in itself is no more than a phantasmagoria. Family, friends, love, domiciles, transportation, prestige. It seems quite real, quite tangible. And yet, as if awakening from a dreaming state, when we transition from this body to our next state of consciousness, we will totally forget about family, friends, and love in this lifetime. Uh, it will not be of any significance whatsoever. If, even if we remember it, it will be so remote and so distant uh, and so not relative that in fact, it was nothing more than a dream. Everybody experiences when you're sleeping at night, on one level, you're in your bed in Spanish Fork. But once you start dreaming, any sort of a plot with characters and family members and uh, enemies and friends, it all spins out in your mind. And it's so real that you totally forget your daytime identity. You totally forget that you're sleeping in your bed in Spanish Fork, Utah, and you identify 100% with all those characters in the dream. Yet when you wake up the next morning, it's all forgotten. It all recedes into significance. And in the dream, you might have had, you lived in a palace. You might have had a beautiful wife. You might have had incredible transportation, a big position. But what have you got now once you wake up? You've got nothing. You've actually got nothing. All that has ceased to exist. So similarly, just as during the nighttime dream, it seems so real, and yet when we wake up during the day, it has ceased to exist. It has receded into oblivion. Similarly, during our daytime dream, whether it be American or Caucasian or European or Brazilian, whether it be a sweet streeper, whether it be the prime minister, whether it be single or married, whether it be labor or management, it's a dream. It's a dream. And if you wake up from the dream, it's all cease to exist. As soon as you die, as soon as you leave this body, then everything that you worked hard for as an extension of this body, it evaporates. And nothing is left to show for it. This is due to what we call the gunas. Gunas means ropes. And there are three ropes, there are three shackles which keep us in this material world. Originally, from the spiritual world, we get thrown. That's the first action of illusion. And then having get thrown into this material world, because don't forget, we're not material. We're spiritual beings, parts and parcels of God. But some or other, due to contemplation of the objects of the senses, we were lured into the material world, or we allowed ourselves to be lured in the material world. And when we got here, we got covered. So there's those two actions, the throwing action and the covering action. The covering function is given over to the three gunas, the three chains of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. So under the influence of the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance, we revolve in the cycle of birth, death, disease, and old age in this material world. Therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, 14th chapter, 20th verse, Gunamatan aticha trin dehi deha shamud bhavaha Due to attachment to the three modes of material nature, we become embodied. And as such, we suffer the pangs of Janma Mritu Jara Vyadir, birth, death, disease, and old age. And until we get free from the influence of goodness, passion, and ignorance, the Mukta Mritu Mashnute, we're not going to taste the nectar of immortality. We have to clean out particularly the two lower modes of passion and ignorance before we can begin to be revive our original spiritual consciousness. The exact translation of that verse, when the embodied being is able to transcend these three modes associated with the material body, he can become free from birth, death, old age and their distresses and can enjoy nectar even in this life. One should elevate oneself to the mode of goodness, peacefulness, nonviolence, compassion, sensitivity, 
that love which enjoys deep, intimate, sensitive, considerate relationships, as well as awakening one's love of and awareness of the Creator, our loving Father. And then from the material mode of goodness, one can then elevate to the spiritual mode of goodness called Vishuddha Shatva. So one who is in pure goodness as opposed to material goodness is described in the following way. Brahma Bhuta Parshanatma. Coming to the level of spirit, detaching from the object of the material senses, one feels Parshanatma. Deep, unbudgeable, unshakable satisfaction. Just like it is said, Apuryamanam Achalat Pratishtam like an ocean, a vast reservoir of water. No matter how many rivers flow into that ocean or that big lake, from doesn't matter how many directions, because of the depth of that body of water, none of those rivers can disturb it. Similarly, because of the depth of one's self-realization, nothing external, no material circumstances, can disturb it. No contact of the senses with the sense objects can cause a realized soul, a Brahma Bhuta soul, to get dislodged again and then go chasing after the dream of material sense gratification. And for someone who's situated in the Brahma Bhuta stage, it is said, Nasochiti Nakanchiti. One neither hankers after attaining the things of this world nor does one lament after losing the things of this material world. One is equally situated towards all living beings. Now to set an example of self-realization, knowledge of the difference between matter and spirit, and detachment from the objects of material sense gratification, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, kindly, mercifully, descended 500 years ago as his own devotional incarnation in the form of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It is said by Rupa Goswami, is stated in the Sri Kavi Karnapura, Bhairagya Bija Nija Bhakti Yogena Shikshartam Eka Purushaparanam Sri Krishna Chaitanya Sariratari in order to teach detachment from the objects of material sense gratification and vidya, knowledge as to the difference between matter and spirit, and to awaken bhakti, which is the original nature of the soul, Shikshartam, the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, descended as the teacher of bhakti. The Purusha Parana, the original primeval source of everything from whom everything comes, he descended as the supreme teacher of knowledge and detachment through the practice of Bhakti Yoga. His name in that devotional incarnation was Sri Chaitanya Sariradari Kripambudir Yashtam Aham And uh, the Goswami who um, tendered this prayer says, uh, in the face of this disarming, all-consuming mercy and love, compassion and forgiveness, I prostrate myself and offer my respectful obeisances under the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya. The, Lord, the power, the mercy, the forgiveness of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is such that doesn't matter how mired one is, how stuck one is in the muck of sense gratification, how mad he is, how much he's lost it, searching after, chasing after the illusion of family, friends, and country, doesn't matter. The power of Lord Chaitanya to deliver is greater than our power to remain stuck in this material world. Our example for this morning is that of Maharaj Yayati extremely mired in sense gratification. He met his wife, Devayani. She was the daughter of the guru of the Daichas, 
named Sukracharya. She had had a maidservant named Sarmista. Sarmista was born from the warrior caste. Devyadi had been born from the Brahminical caste. But one day they were out in the woods and they started to argue who's better, the kings or the Brahmins. The argument got hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And Sarmista, perhaps being the daughter of a king and a warrior and possibly being a little more physically strong than Devyani, ended up tossing Devyani in a well and then walking off. So Devyani's in the bottom of a hell, hell. King Yayati happened to come along and he saved her from the well. He said, now you're free to go back to your palace. And she said, no, you've saved my life, so please marry me. He said, I'm a warrior, you're a Brahmin. Brahmins are higher caste. Anyway, it was arranged that Maharaj Yayati marry Devyani. And the marriage was okay. I mean, they were happy. There were two sons born of Devyani. But apparently Yayati's senses were not under control because unknown to his wife Devyani, he had an affair with her arch enemy, maidservant Sarmista, silently. And as a result of his multiple unions, secretive unions with Sarmista, there were three sons born. And he was a king with vast properties and so he kept those three boys in a remote part of the gardens, of the grounds of the palace. They had their own domicile, their own residence. They had their own gardens. They had their own place to play. One day, Yayati was walking through the gardens with Devayani, who again had two sons by her husband. They came to the area that we're talking about and three young, very good-looking, muscular, warrior-like boys spied Yayati walking with Devayani and extended their arms, got big smiles on their faces. They began running towards him with their arms outstretched, shouting, Daddy! Daddy! <laughs> Yayati was nabbed. He was caught. Devyani, she looks and she says, What? And remember, she had two sons. So her arch enemy who had thrown her in the well originally had three sons by her husband. You can imagine the depth of her <laughs> humiliation as well as her outrage. She happened to be the daughter of one of the most powerful mystic sages of all time. And so when she went to her dad to complain about her husband's infidelity, Sukracharya cursed. He said, since your husband is so lusty, since your husband is so controlled by the enemy lust and so much involved in sense gratification, what we'll do is we'll put a stop to that right now. I curse him to be instantly and prematurely aged. I curse that the power of his senses diminish almost to nil. No sooner had those words come out of Sukracharya's mouth than Yayati became old and wrinkled and lost all of his testosterone. But even though his body was no longer able to fulfill lusty desires, they still remain in his mind. The hankering, the craving for it does not so easily go away when the body ages. Prabhupada told how in Paris, even 80-year-old men would pay, this is in the 60s, when $100 was actually a lot of money, old men 80 years old would go into certain quarters of Paris, Pijal, the Moulin Rouge, and they would pay $100 to have an hour's association with a young girl. Even though their bodies were no longer able to act out their lusty fantasies, the minds were still attached because of a lifelong pattern of behavior. So Maharaj Yati was not 
ready to give up sense gratification, even though his body was no longer capable of uh, responding according to his mental desires. And so he asked his various sons if they would take the premature old age for some time until Yayati could, having regained his youth, satisfy his senses, and then he would uh, lapse into old age, having satisfied his desires for sense gratification. So it's another story, how he went to his oldest son, Yadu, and Yadu refused, he went to his next son, he had five sons, remember? So it was finally Puru, the youngest son, I believe it was of Sarmista, who accepted the premature old age of Yayati. So Puru became aged in order to assist his father. Yayati became old, uh, young, again full of vigor, he was again, and Dayaviani, to be truth be told, she was she was happy because she, as soon as her father cursed her son to be old, she said, well, what about me? I'm young too, and I, I still have desires. So she was just as happy as Yayati that there was some resolution to the problem. <laughs> and anyway, in those days, kings could have multiple lives. There was license for kings to pursue sense gratification. <clears throat> However... After 1,000 additional years, in which basically it was a go, basically he had a green light to do, drink, taste, enjoy the company of opposite sex to any degree he wanted, he came to the realization that there is no point at which you're ever going to be satisfied by material sense gratification. This is what he said. Purnam Vaishya. Sahashame, Vishayan Sevato Sakrit, Tatapi Chanu Shavanam, Trishnu Teshu Pajayate. He said, I've spent a full 1,000 years enjoying sense gratification, yet my desires to enjoy such pleasure increases daily. So if you're under the illusion that at some point you can walk away from sense gratification, here's some, a very sobering statement from someone who enjoyed to the full extent as a king in ancient times. After a thousand years, his desires were not less, but even after a thousand years, they were increasing daily. Just like if you pour gasoline on the fire, Liquids, generally speaking, will extinguish a fire. However, if you mistake gasoline for water, and instead of pouring water on the fire, you pour gasoline on the fire, the result will not be that the fire is extinguished, but that the fire will blaze up higher. So pursuing sense gratification and hoping at the same time to extinguish material desires is going to be just about as successful as trying to put out a fire by pouring gasoline on it. So it was not because Puru had satisfied his desires as he had originally intended, but it was rather the opposite because he realized that the desires are getting more and more vehement all the time. Then he finally went back to his son Puru and he said, please give me now the decrepitude. Thank you so much for having done this for me. You will be the king, and your descendants will be the king forever after. Um, and now I give you your youth, youth back. At that point, Marjati gave up all pursuit of material sense gratification. Then he sublimated his senses into the sublime, elevating, purifying service of the Lord. Now he used his hands to worship the Lord, his mouth to chant, the holy names of the Lord, his eyes to see the image of the Lord, his ears to hear about the glories of the Lord. And he did this in exile, in retirement, in a forest ashram. The time came sooner than you'd think. By the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and the devotees and by the power of the holy name, it did not take as long as you would expect for Marj uh, Yayati to turn his back on sense gratification once and for all and emerge himself in loving devotional service of Krishna. 
there is this stunning, very evocative verse which ends the happy story of Maharaj Yati. Asevitam Varshav Pagam, Sad Bargam Vishayashu Sa, Sarayam Uchata Nidam, Jata Paksha Iva Nidaha. The example is given that Maharaj Yayati reached a point of spiritual maturity. Never again looked back or hankered for the illusory affairs of material sense gratification. And the example here is extremely visual. Of a little tiny baby, his wings are not yet formed. So he stands on the edge of the nest, but he's not going to jump because he knows if he jumps, he'll fall like a rock. So he stands, his wings grow a little bit. Another day, stands, his wings grow a little bit. A week comes by, he feels his wings lengthening, strengthening, and finally the day comes when he intuits that if he jumps, his wings are fully enough developed that he will fly and soar and elevate himself to the next level. So Maharaj Yayati, after returning the decrepit to the, his youth to his son, reached full spiritual maturity by practicing devotional service for a short time in the woods. But why is it that this uh, spirituality, this freedom from bondage, from the ropes that keep us chain to birth, death, disease, and only. Why is it that that freedom after who knows how many hundreds, if not thousands of previous incarnations, flat out pursuing sense gratification, why is it that one can so quickly and easily get free from that and go back to home, back to Godhead? It is simply because that's our true nature. It is our true nature, Nitya Siddha, Krishna Prema, Sadhu Karinai. We are constitutionally and eternally servants of the Lord. That is who we are. That's where our purpose, our meaning, our joy, our peace lives. And so it's not that difficult to revive your devotional service by hearing and chanting. And you get the blessing of the most merciful incarnation of the Lord. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, as soon as you begin chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Doesn't matter how long the dirty things have been accumulating in the heart. Doesn't ha matter how much garbage, how much thick, inky, like impenetrable darkness has enveloped the core of the heart. All that is smashed, just like a thunderbolt of Indra can smash a huge mountain. Similarly, the thunderbolt of the holy names delivered by the authorized incarnation, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, can smash even a huge mountain of sins. And thus it was in the case of Maharaj Yati. He very quickly became freed of sinful activities and attained his original position as a personal associate of the Lord. Very quickly, Marjiyati developed his Swarupa Siddhi, or his eternal spiritual body, and resumed service of the Lord. Srinvata Swakata Krishnam, simply hearing and chanting and discussing the Kata of Krishna, Srinvata Swakata Krishnam, Punya Sravanam Kirtanam, by the process of hearing and chanting, that in and of itself makes one totally pious. And unless one is pious, one cannot relish the pastimes of Krishna. So even for one such as Maharaj Yayati, and we can identify with him because we were born in families of gross materialists. We were born in the Kali Yuga age, the age of materialism, quarrel and hypocrisy. Of course we can resonate with Marj Yati. We lacked piety. Just like Marj Yayati lived an impious life pursuing sensuality. Doesn't matter. We don't have to independently and separately pursue piety in order to become qualified to relish the tops of Krishna. By chanting and hearing, 
even if it's mechanically, even in the neophyte stage, what happens is that Krishna is already in the heart of a living being. Yomam pasati sarvata saram chame pasati tashaham na pranasati satan me na pranasati. Krishna awakens from within the heart of the practicing chanter, the practicing devotee, and Krishna delivers you. UPS, FedEx, USPS, flat rate, priority mail from within the heart. He delivers you piety. Yesham tu anta paptam papam. It is said that unless one is completely pious in this life, not only that, but has a background of piety for any number of previous lives, one cannot relish the pastimes of Krishna. We don't have a background of piety. We weren't pious even earlier in this life. We weren't pious in our last lives. So how is it then that one comes very quickly to relish Krishna Kata? Because Krishna and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, from within the very heart of the devotee, banish all darkness, all garbage, clean it all up, and deliver that piety which is normally only achieved after many, many lifetimes. Therefore it is said, who can compare to the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Namo Mahabharanaya Krishna Prema Vradayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namane Gaurad Svayanamaha Prabhupada said, one who chants or hears the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam becomes pious automatically. To become pious, one generally has to endeavor a great deal. But if one simply hears the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita, one becomes pious automatically. Why? Krishna helps from within the heart as Surit Satam, your best well-wishing friend. He not only washes out all the dirt, but he gives the results of unlimited pious activities. Finally, concluding our session today, this is the last paragraph of Prabhupada's purport to this magnificent verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Finishing up, Prabhupada writes, To become restless in the contact of women and wealth is not an astonishment, because every living being is associated with such things from remote time, practically immemorial, and it takes some time, although not as much as you'd think, to recover from this foreign nature. But if one is engaged in hearing the glories of the Lord, he quickly regains his real position of eternality, bliss, and knowledge in the loving devotional service of the Lord. By the grace of God, such a devotee gets sufficient strength to defend himself from the state of disturbances and quickly all disturbing elements are eliminated from his mind and he comes up to the highest standard of pure devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Thanks for being with us this Monday morning. Blair, good to see that you've tuned in. Wonderful friend of ours over at Utah Valley University is having a peek and a listen Narendra uh, Nora from Venezuela, Argentina, Raman Nagarajan, Anjali, one of our regulars, and we love Anjali, we love her input, her comments. By the way, she calls this Motivational Monday. Rupa Manjari from Sacramento area, Sindhu Lao, another regular, Prashant, right here from Salt Lake City, uh, Manasa Ganga from Northern California, Mary from Reno, uh, Raj Mohan from Salt Lake City. Thank you all for joining us on this Motivational Monday, and we'll be back for what Anjali calls Taco Tuesday tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. when we're going to move to the 18th verse in the first chapter, first canto of the Beautiful story of the absolute truth, Srimad Bhagavatam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.